Today's featured presentation is entitled Evidence-Based Update on the Family Planning, Pills, Patches, and IUDs. Our presenter for tonight's webinar is Dr. Jade Moore Ruffin. Dr. Moore Ruffin is a 1992 graduate of Memphis State University and a board-certified family physician. She earned her MD degree from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee and completed residency training at Family Medicine at Grant Family Medicine Residency Program in Columbus, Ohio, where she also served as a chief resident. Dr. Moore Ruffin was selected to join the 2009 inaugural Satcher Health Leadership Institute Health Policy Leadership Fellowship while becoming faculty of the Family Medicine Residency Department at Morehouse School of Medicine. After completing her fellowship, she joined the Whiteford Community Program as the medical director. Whiteford Community Program is a community-based, community-driven organization that strives to empower the approximately 2,000 residents of the Whiteford Elementary School catchment area, which is located in the Edge Edgewood community of Southeast Atlanta. And the goal of it is to take charge of themselves, their children, and their community. As it relates to accreditation for this presentation tonight, the application for CME credits has been filed with the American Academy of Family Physicians, and it is still pending. The educational activity is pending designation for the, a maximum of one prescribed credit by the American Academy of Family Physicians. Physicians should only claim credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in this activity. By the end of this presentation, participants will be able to discuss elements of the medical and sexual history, describe common hormonal family planning methods available to women, and provide counseling addressing the advantages and disadvantages of the methods. Today's presentation will be divided into three sections with brief intermissions for questions from the audience at the end of each section. There will be an extended question and answer session at the end of the presentation. However, questions and comments can be submitted to the presenter throughout the presentations. To submit questions, please just type your questions in and send them. Without any further ado, I present to you Dr. Moore Ruffin. Thank you, Richard, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. I do have to mention that I do not have any financial or other relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial services discussed in this educational activity tonight. Objectives. By the end of this presentation, you, the participants, will be able to discuss the elements of a medical and sexual history, describe common hormonal family planning methods available to women, and be able to provide counseling addressing some of the advantages and disadvantages of each method discussed tonight. There are other contraception options that, that you will find are, that are not covered tonight that are worth mentioning and will result in a series part two for um, the sake of time we were not able to include them on tonight. That includes vaginal rings, injectables such as Depo-Provera, implantables such as Implanine, and emergency contraception. We want to start by talking about female contraception use. This 2002 National Survey of Family Growth survey reports here eight women ages 15 to 44 and their premarital first encounter methods of birth controls that were used from 1980, excuse me, prior to 1980 to 2002. If you look here, before 1980, only about 2% of those surveyed used a dual-use method for birth control. If you look upward in the very same uh, area, before 1980, 57% of females reported no method of birth control or contraceptive use by first encounter. If you move up to 1990, Nine to 2002, that number has significant. Those numbers have significantly changed. 17% of first encounters do have a dual use method, so that is more than one method of birth control that's used, and the, there is a significant decrease 
in those who indicate no method. That number is down to 21%. Uh, percent. So dual methods have been become more common and no method has become less common. Males were also um, surveyed by the same uh, surveying uh, method in the 2002 National Survey of Family Growth, ages 15 to 44 again. And if we note here, prior to 1980, only 2.8% of males had a dual use or more than one method of use, and 61 uh, reported no method. Again, we see similar trends um, over the past 20 years to see that by 2002 surveys, only 13% reported no method, and 12% reported dual use. So we see that we're making some improvements there. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things we want to do leading up to discussing contraceptive options with our women. We want to make sure we obtain a very thorough medical history. That medical history should include the menstrual his history. That includes the age at menarche or how old were they when they had their first cycle. What was the date, the date of the beginning of their last menstrual period, their LMP? What's the duration of their cycles? How long are they lasting? Are they four days, are they seven days, 10 days, and, or longer in some cases? How regular are their cycles and their, and their menstrual bleeding? Are they having any spotting, any breakthrough uh, bleeding? And what's the cycle length? What's the length of time that elapses between cycles? Is it 28 days? Is it 19 days, 19 to 28? Um, or is it longer than that, 35 days, which would be of concern? Are there any cramps? And does this, does menstrual periods, do menstrual periods impact their activities? Are, for adolescents, are they not participating in sports? Are they missing days of school? Uh, for older women, are they missing days at work or not participating? in other activities that they would otherwise do if they were not experiencing their menstrual cycle. And then we want to know about their history, their medical history, as it relates to conditions, both uh, chronic and those that are current, as well as in their past, so their past medical history. Particularly, we look at uh, pulmonary embolism, any DVTs or deep vein thrombosis, heart attacks, MIs, migraine headaches, and not all migraines, but we want to be prompted to gain more information and do a deeper history around migraines. Do they have an aura? Do they note that there are symptoms leading up to uh, the migraine headache? Are they experiencing any neurological deficits, any visual loss, any loss of sensation, any um, problems with uh, motor or sensory problems during the migraine headaches? And are there any personal or family histories of other blood clots? If there are histories of blood clots for family members as well as the patient, particularly women who were in their teens or 20s or 30s who had no other cause for um, having blood clots that had been identified, those are things that are of concern. And so we want to make sure that we are offering those women or performing a workup for clotting disorders, looking for those that may have genetic mutations that would be of, uh, of concern before initiating or with initiating contraceptives. And what are their prior experiences with contraception? Have they used anything in the past? Uh, why did they stop it if they're not currently using it? What did they like or did not like about it? Uh, what side effects may they have experienced while um, using pills? And that can help or uh, other methods of contraception, and that can help to drive or uh, inform the decision-making throughout the visit. Another question that often comes up is, what physical exam uh, items need to be done? Do I need to do a pelvic exam or pap smears um, prior to initiating contraception? Pelvic exams are not necessary if 
a female is not experiencing STI or sexually transmitted infection symptoms. So if they're not having any vaginal discharge, they're not having any lower abdominal or pelvic pain. And I would also add if they're not having any spotting, which may indicate cervicitis, um, then they don't necessarily have to have the pelvic exam prior to initiating um, contraception. At some point, it may be relevant to do that. And we also want to add, too, if they don't have a history of a recent or a partner uh, recent or past that has been diagnosed with an STI that they have not uh, been tested or the partner may or may not have been treated um, as well. The next question is about pap smears. When are pap smears necessary and do they have to be done prior to initiating contraceptives? And the answer is that not until the woman is 21 or the young lady is 21 or that three years have elapsed since the onset of vaginal intercourse should she have a, a pap smear. So if it's been a year, if she's 16, there is no specific necessity to indicate to uh, that a pap smear is indicated prior to the initiation of uh, contraceptives. Because hormonal uh, contraceptives do not accelerate cervical neoplasia, or interfere with cervical cytology. So if they have not had recent past years, that would not be a contraindication to beginning. <clears throat> what factors affect, if, uh, affect contraceptive use or the selection of contraceptives? Many times it's attitudes towards pregnancy. Do I want to prevent pregnancy and for how long? Do I, am I thinking about pregnancy in another year or five or ten years or in a month, so what? how long do I want to prevent pregnancy? What side effects exist? Will this hurt me? Would this, would this be harmful to me both short term and long term? Will I have uh, problems as a result of this becoming pregnant later? So fertility becomes a concern. Um, will I be able to afford it? What's the cost of it? How often will I have to invest in it? The convenience factor of it. Um, how will it help me? Are there some additional benefits that I may get out of taking hormonal therapies? Do any of my friends use it or what methods have they recommended or had experiences with that they either liked or didn't like for that matter? I know in the adolescent populations, the peer is a very, very ready resource um, that is used very often to gain information and in, in decision making. What are the myths and misconceptions that have been heard? What have they heard about these around weight gain or hair loss or skin changes? What are some of the things that may be of concern? And many times we have to ask these questions to get this information as we discuss options with our young women regarding contraceptive use. Particularly with adolescents, there's always the question, often the question, excuse me, of will my parents find out and what can I do? Is this confidential? And those are very important. It's very important to reassure adolescents that uh, these discussions are um, able to take place in a confidential environment. And for other women, will their partner find out, particularly with certain types of uh, contraceptive use? And then are their partners supportive? Will they assist them, especially adolescents, in remembering their pills and remembering their schedules? And will there be any sabotage around condom use? I mean, we're talking about uh, hormonal means tonight, but we often do have to discuss uh, all contraceptive options. Other things that are important are to talk about just even things around adherence and uh, how often the teen or the adult may be engaging in sexual intercourse. So how long should, uh, should they use these methods and what's the benefit given the amount of sexual activity that they may experience in a month or over a year's time? Especially uh, something to consider with uh, many uh, military families or military wives who whose husbands are deployed. So we, those are things that may come up in discussion. 
So we'll move forward to discuss one um, topic uh, for tonight, which is oral contraceptive pills. So questions that we'll answer is about safety and how effective are the pills, what are side effects that are common, and um, what are the costs and many of the choices that are available, and what are the health benefits of using oral contraceptive pills. COCs or combined oral contraceptives, COCs for the remainder of the talk, are safe. They have few contraindications. If we look at the WHO or World Health Organization classifications, class four, four uh, being absolute contraindications, um, would include or contraindications would include clotting disorders, and we spoke to this. Uh, a little bit in a previous slide, particularly those who have genetic mutations that are present. Histories of clotting disorders such as uh, DVTs or pulmonary embolisms. We talked about migraines with focal uh, deficits or aura. And then hypertension, because we, do, we did talk earlier about heart disease and ischemic heart disease, particularly um, myocardial infarctions or uh, heart attacks otherwise. And then structural heart disease, such as pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, uh, histories of subacute bacterial endocarditis, um, and severe hypertension. Those who have a blood pressure of 160 plus over 100 or those that have high blood pressure that is uncontrolled with vascular complications, those are women that you are category four and you want to, to uh, stay away from using COCs in those women. For those who have well controlled um, high blood pressure or hypertension, they fall into a class three in which benefits of preventing pregnancy in this group generally outweigh the risk. And those are, part, are things that would have to be discussed very openly and um, determined by the woman um, in discussion with the healthcare provider. So what are some other uh, category three uh, uh, conditions for which uh, women would be candidates or would have to consider candidacy? There are a few others. Most women, however, are, who are healthy are potential candidates. But we do want to consider those who obviously are pregnant or those who have been recently pregnant, less than 21 days postpartum, those that are lactating and it has been less than six months, um, those that have active gallbladder disease, those that are on any medications that may interfere with the efficacy, uh, antibiotics, for example, or anticonvulsants. Um, and if there's an undiagnosed abnormal vaginal or uterine bleeding, that's another reason to think carefully prior to initiating um, contraceptives. Other conditions that are important, class four, would be cancers, particularly those that are estrogen driven, such as breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and also liver uh, cancers. Those women that have had active or have active viral hepatitis or severe cirrhosis, those are other women to consider uh, using some other method of contraceptives. COCs or combined oral contraceptives are effective when used correctly and consistently. The failure rate for combined or COCs is less than 1%. So 99.7% efficacy in correct and consistent use. However, because we do not live in a perfect world, we also must consider typical use and typical adult use. And that is actually approximately 3% um, difference. 8% is listed here, which is approximately 3%. So about a 97% uh, efficacy rate. Um, for adolescents, however, because mainly uh, of issues with compliance and adherence to the consistency that's required with oral contraceptives, failure rates may vary pretty, pretty largely between 5 and 25 
33%. Research indicates that 33% of adolescents, so about a third of them, are adherent to the COC use after one year. So two thirds are not really using them properly. So that's important to revisit uh, and have patients to come back in when there's concern of uh, their ability to remain um, adherent. Let's talk now a little bit about mechanisms of actions and how do CLCs work. There are three main ways CLCs work. Uh, primarily it's by the block blockade of LH and FSA, so your gonadotrophins uh, are blocked so that they do not permit ovulation. So the gonadotrophin releasing hormones of the hypothalamus ordinarily would signal the pituitary to release, uh, to signal the ovaries to release uh, LH and FSH. However, through a ne negative feedback loop, that is inhibited. So we don't get those surges um, during the menstrual cycle, the 28-day menstrual cycle. Also, thickening of cervical mucus to prevent sperm penetration. And then the inhib inhibition of capacitation of the sperm and the fallopian tubes discharge of eggs. What are some health benefits of using CLCs? There are several menstrual related uh, health benefits, which include a reduction in uh, menstrual pain or discomfort, so decreased dysmenorrhea, and a decrease in the amount of blood loss. So those women who um, have excessive blood loss during their menstrual cycles may experience an actual benefit from using um, CLCs. And the redu reduction of menstrual-related PMS syndromes, or PMDD. And it also helps to reduce anovulatory bleeding, or bleeding or spotting uh, throughout the month. And can reduce the incidence of anemia or excessive blood loss through some of the mechanisms that we just discussed. Other health benefits include reduction in the number of ectopic pregnancies, as well as endometrial and ovarian cancer risk, and the reduction of benign breast conditions and pelvic inflammatory disease. There are a couple of um, OCPs or COCs that also help to improve skin problems such as acne and hirsutism or overgrowth of, of hair. And those are YAS, orthotricycline, and estrotip. Step, excuse me. What are some side effects? Really, they're limited. Uh, estrogen related side effects include breast tenderness, nausea, vomiting as a result of nausea, uh, some increases in blood pressure. And I would, would uh, comment that it is important to have your patients that are newly initiated on. Uh, on COCs or those that have had a change in the particular brand or kind uh, or dosing over time should have regular blood pressure monitoring. And those that uh, have will have vascular headaches. Chalasma. Some other uh, estrogen related side effects that are rare but serious uh, would uh, follow the AICS acronym, and these are reasons that the medical provider should be contacted immediately if your patient should experience any of these symptoms, which include pretty significant and severe abdominal pain or unexplained abdominal pain, <clears throat> chest pain, headaches, eye or visual changes, and the S is severe leg pain or swelling or anything that may indicate uh, venous thrombosis or clots. So if any of these ap appear after um, initiation, these are reasons that the medical provider should be contacted and they should discontinue the use. <clears throat> what are some progesterone-related side effects? Swelling or edema. <clears throat> 
generally in the lower ex extremities, sometimes in the hands, abdominal bloating, anxiety and irritability, some mood changes such as depression, and they may feel achy and have um, unexplained vague complaints of, of feeling joint pains or, or muscle pains, and then menstrual irregularities, particularly spotting. What are the types of COCs that exist? Well, there are many of them. COCs that <clears throat> contain generally 20 to 50 micrograms of ethanyl estradiol, or EE is the formulation of estrogen, of the estrogen component. The newer formulations are uh, rarely containing more than 35 micrograms. There, we're just finding that there's seldom a, a use for those larger doses of um, of estrogen. There are eight types of, um, and I must also comment that there's a much lower dose of progestin. And of progestins, there are eight different types of those that are classified by their pharmacology and their generations. What are the generations? There's your first generation, so those are our older OCPs, norethanurone. <clears throat> Second generations include levonorgestrel and norgestrel. Third generations are your desogestrel and norgestimate. And those tend to have uh, very few androgenic effects, so not seeing as much hirsutism with those uh, types of, uh, or menstrual irregularities with those types of, um, of um, progestins. And the fourth generation, uh, which is also in the gonane uh, category of these types of, in fact, the second, uh, third, and fourth generations are in that category. Excuse me, the second and third generations are in that category. And each of the first, second, and third are derivatives of 19 uh, tes nor testosterone. The fourth generation, which is dropin uh, dropirinon, is derived from 17 alpha spironolactone. So that is the newest form of progestin for the newest generation. COC's formulations, <clears throat> they're monophasic, biphasic, and triphasic uh, formulations. With monophasic, the hormone levels remain constant throughout the month, throughout the menstrual cycle, the, the pack uh, of the uh, pills. There's no variation in color and in dosing of the hormone levels. Those are your older uh, orthonovum, demulins, low ovaral, orthocycline, low estrogen and less in orthocep. Those are your lower uh, estrogen uh, CLCs. Then there's bicyclic or biphasic, um, and those change, those hormone levels change uh, at least once, or excuse me, once during the cycle. Those include your orthonovum and your neocon. And then your triphasics, you get three different doses of hormones, which change every seven days in the first three weeks of the Heal cycle. Examples of those would include your triphasals, your orthonovums. Compared with monophasics, the biphasics and triphasics have been thought to reduce the total hormone dosage a woman receives and are thought to better match a woman's own hormonal variation throughout the menstrual cycle, thought to reduce symptoms and side effects, as well as um, uh, variations in bleeding throughout the cycle. Talking more about formulations of the monthly cycling, the 21 and 7, so those are three weeks of active, active um, pills and uh, one week of placebo. There's the shortened pill-free interval, uh, which um, is pill-free from seven to four days, resulting in a shorter bleed. And then the extended use where you're doing bicycling or tricycling or even continuous use. And then there is um, 
the um, low estrogen uh, after recently FDA uh, fairly recently in 2006 approved low estrogen 24 which contains 24 active 20 microgram ethanol estradiol EEs and one milligram of your norethindron progesterone pills plus four iron placebo pills. What are some other recent advances in fourth generation progestins particularly? We look at uh, Yasmin, which was approved in 2001, which is your monophasic and contains 30 micrograms of EE and three milligrams of a fourth generation progestin that we discussed on an earlier slide. Uh, 2006, about four years ago, five years ago, YAS was approved, which contains a lower dose of the um, estrogen component, so you're 20 micrograms and 3 milligrams of the same uh, fourth generation progestin. There are 24 active pills and 4 placebo. And this has also been approved by the FDA to treat pre PMDD, a premenstrual dysphoric disorder as well as skin problems, such as acne. <clears throat> Additionally, there are extended cycle COCs, those that don't require interruption. And typically, these result in, over time, a reduction in the number of menstrual cycles that um, your patients will have uh, over the year's time. Excuse me. You have seasonal, which is the older of the um, extended cycle CLCs, seasonique, which was about five years ago, and most recently uh, liberal, 2007. And the number of periods can be reduced uh, over the year's time. And um, <clears throat> for many women, this is a a really great option, especially those for which we are getting some secondary benefits, such as irregular uh, or heavy menstrual cycles or painful menstrual cycles, dysmenorrhea. When counseling patients, what are some of the issues that we need to consider and how do we facilitate the appropriate use of COCs? Uh, establishing a time each day to take the pill is really important especially with your adolescents, even your working uh, women uh, who are just busy. Let's face it, uh, we are doing more uh, each day and taking on more responsibilities and remembering appeal is not always uh, as easy as it seems that it should be because we do want to improve adherence so that we can improve effective rates and reduce those failure rates. Side effects. Uh, Usually, side effects are transient, and it's important to share that information with patients as you initiate uh, contraceptive use. Let them know that there are other brands and types if they experience side effects, that there's, uh, they don't have to feel like this is an only option for them and immediately turn off against any other uh, trials of other cycles. And then what do you do with missed pills? If more than two pills are missed, you do want to caution women that they need to use a backup method or a secondary method of, um, of uh, contraception, i.e. a condom, a condom with uh, spermicide uh, would be a, a, a good backup method or backup plan, so that's important. And in some instances, it uh, may be important to also discuss prescriptions for emergency contraception for ECs. Are CLCs the right choice for this patient? So this is where you talk about advantages and disadvantages with your patient. Uh, for CLCs, the advantages are they are effective, they are safe, they are often quick to return to fertility. So that question of um, whether or not I would have to wait a long time or how is this going to impact um, over time the fertility of your patients. It's important to say that generally CLCs are a quick return. And then 
discussing other health benefits in women who may experience some of the symptoms that we uh, described earlier. What are disadvantages? Well, the one primary disadvantage is that it requires daily use. It requires daily adherence, and you do generally want to stick to a relatively about the same time uh, of day. Um, it's semi-private, uh, <clears throat> so someone else knows uh, that that's happening if you're using insurance or, uh, in some cases, using uh, your parents' uh, insurances for example, adolescence, then it becomes less private and that's a confidentiality issue. Um, but estrogen related um, side effects are another concern and we talked about um, cancers and uh, other problems that may result in vascular disease. And then uh, meds that induce cytochrome P450, they may decrease in effectiveness. And I think we talked about that earlier, like your anticonvulsants, uh, such as carbamazepine, uh, certain antibiotics, um, for those that are being treated for tuberculosis, rifampin is another, um, another um, antibiotic that we, you want to consider as, as something if that patient is taking chronic or long-term medication. <clears throat> questions. We have two questions, I think, here now. Uh, the first question is, is there a cost benefit to prescribing seasonal or seasonique over more frequent refills of a similar formulation of a monophasic monthly pack? Um, and that answer would probably be, uh, the cost benefit would, would be with using a more common or more frequently uh, used or even generic preparation of, of, of a pill um, because there's certainly going to be a big difference in cost and that could uh, that could be the difference between you know, 60, 70 dollars versus three or four hundred dollars. Uh, the only uh, difference is that that would be an off-label use. Um, and the seasonal and seasonique do have FDA uh, approval for extended use. So I hope that helps Ms. Alvarez. Um, next question is how is the FDA warnings about YAS affecting uh, prescribing and how are we counseling um, women about using um, uh, contraceptives, particularly yes, and <clears throat> yeah, yeah, probably one of the bigger effects has been the cost, and so I don't use it a lot, quite honestly, so I don't <clears throat> have, excuse me, uh, many problems with um, uh, around prescribing or concerns with using yes. I do counsel women, uh, just like all of them, and we talked about this earlier, around uh, really being uh, cognizant of any side effects that they may experience and really that detailed medical history around uh, uh, blood clotting history, around um, heart disease and it, particularly in young women, um, as well as um, anything that, that we talked about earlier that could be a risk factor for cerebrovascular accidents or any vascular, vasculopathy. So uh, I think really digging into that um, medical history and really recognizing that there are so many options out there uh, that um, we really can look around choice and options for, uh, for our women. Thank you so much for your questions. Are there any others? Okay, we'll move forward to the transdermal patch. Yes, Doctor, there's a couple of other questions coming through. Let me send them over okay. to you. This should be another one up on your screen. Don't see it yet. Okay, I'll read it. It's from... Um, 
it's how do you choose what COC to give to a patient, i.e. monophasis or biophasis or triophasis? And is there a difference depending on specific characteristics slash history of patients? That's a very good question. How do you choose between monophasics, biphasics, and triphasals? Um, and, and is there any real reason to choose one or over the other? And the belief is that there is no real reason. There's not, uh, there's some recent Cochrane reviews of uh, over 20 articles uh, that talked about triphasal usage versus monophasic as it relates to uh, side effect control, um, as it relates to breakthrough bleeding or spotting. Um, and there have been really no major significant differences that indicate one over the over the other. I'll tell you one of the things to think about um, is ease of use and what are they most likely to get right to be able to use you know easily and if they don't have any other reasons to use larger doses of estrogen i.e. primarily looking at their weight if they would not require a higher dose of estrogen then you're usually pretty good with those that pills that are less than 35 micrograms, 35 micrograms or less, and you're really safe with using monophasic. I mean, let's face it, it can get really complicated if you are looking at the different color variations throughout the wheel. Um, if you're looking at, you know, your placebo weeks and you get off a little bit. So uh, the answer is there is no specific reason to use one over the other and some of the benefits that we thought existed earlier. Um, on when these were derived are not really showing that, that they are significant enough to influence um, prescribing. One of the other things that we mentioned around those variations in dosing is again also mimicking the uh, changes uh, that would naturally occur during the menstrual cycle with variations in estrogen and progesterone levels. But again, we're just not seeing any real reasons to do, to do that. So your monophasics in most cases should suffice. Thank you. OK, I think that's it. I think we can move forward to the, to the next okay. to the part of the presentation. Thank you. OK. Just like with COCs, we'll talk about safety, efficacy, side effects, health benefits and cost uh, effectiveness. Uh, the transdermal patch um, is a beige, so it's kind of a flesh tone, uh, approximately 20 square, square centimeter patch that sticks to the skin and contains both um, estrogen or ethanol estradiol, as we mentioned earlier, at 75 micrograms, as well as a progestin component, which is norogestrone, and at 6.0 milligrams. And what happens is that the medication is actually in that sticky portion of the patch that is the medicated portion. So you do want to caution when they're opening that pack that they keep their hands at the corner and not into the uh, sticky medicated portion of, of the patch. And that is continuously released in smaller doses over time over the course of a three week period. It has more than twice the estrogen as your low dose COCs, but that is because those doses will be continuously released over the course of the 21 days that the um, patient or the female has the patch on in use. A new, the, a new patch should be applied once a week for three weeks, followed by one week off. So again, a new patch is applied once a week for three weeks, followed by one week off. Areas uh, that I should mention that you can use the patch or where they can be placed, uh, it's probably easier to re re remember where not to, and that's on the breast. But the patch can be used on the back of the arm or the upper arm. It could be applied to the buttocks, so the upper portion of the buttocks the lower abdomen, near McBurney's point, <laughs> or the upper torso, but it should not be applied to the breast. And it is once a week for three weeks, followed by a week off. 
is the patch safe? Um, <clears throat> Failure rates are similar to COCs. The, um, uh, the patch is actually very forgiving of delayed reapplications or if you forget to put your patch on again. Usually if we can get that patch on within two days, we're still pretty good. If it's more than that, then they should use a backup method. And probably in adolescence, especially because they, if there's some, some delay in reapplication, they may or may not remember whether or not it's been 48 hours or 24 or 72. Utilizing a backup would be a very reasonable thing to encourage and to educate um, your patients around. One study of adolescents um, showed that out of 50 adolescents, it was found that 87% of the participants reported perfect compliance with the use of the patch. Because this patch is administered weekly versus daily, the compliance rates seem to be much, much higher and much better, particularly in the adolescent population. Also, there are some studies that show that, um, uh, again, on the, on the area of reapplication, that the medication could actually stay in the system as long as nine days. We don't want to encourage that, but just as, as a point. <clears throat> Detachment rates are higher with teens just because they're more active, they're more inclined to be uh, participating in sports. So those are some things to consider. And we must consider higher failure rates in those women who are greater than 200 pounds. And for a lot of uh, uh, women, as well as adolescents, as the obesity epidemic, if, if you will, um, has become an issue for us. We do have to consider whether or not this is a safe and effective main, means of birth control for uh, those women who are greater than 198 uh, pounds. Similar side effects and risk, uh, there are increased amounts of estrogen uh, so there may be some increased risk for clots, but that's still a very low um, uh, risk. What are some changes in the FDA's label? In 2006, the FDA included more information on the risk of non-fatal blood clots with the patch that did not uh, result because of new clot risk. So it wasn't that the clot risk was newer or more, but that they found that there needed to be more information released and more more um, information applied to education uh, on the concerns with blood clots. So the warning was about risk and uh, not about um, uh, being strengthened. Putting the VTE or the venous thromboembolism risk into context, context, if you look at the general population, 0.8 or less than 1 uh, per 10,000 women per year is in the general population with COC users, that's three to four out of per 10,000 women. And those who are increased risk um, altogether uh, inherently with pregnancy and postpartum periods, that number does increase uh, in six to, from to, to six to 12 per 10,000. So COCs are right there in the middle between the general population and those that are, that are considered to be at at, at highest risk. Is the patch a right choice? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And we want to look at this as we did with COC. Um, the patch is effective. It is safe. Adherence seems to be improved, particularly in adolescents. There are some similar benefits that may possibly be obtained with COC use, given the similarities in the hormones that are used. And and um, we do have to consider disadvantages. There is more estrogen, so we have to consider more estrogenic impact. It's semi-private, as we discussed before, uh, estrogen-related risk, and hyperpigmentation and irritation as a result of the adhesive um, and the residue. So it's not the medication per se, but the adhesive uh, that is the residue that many, many uh, women, in, in my experience, particularly women of color 
or people of color have experienced uh, some hyperpigmentation and irritation. And what we do is suggest that they rotate sites and not use the same site each time. Sometimes a little hydrocortisone cream um, can be helpful as well of their experience in irritation once they have removed um, that um, as well. And cost can be a, a concern because there, there is a higher uh, cost to this. Uh, there is no generic availability. So there is a higher cost uh, when you consider using the patch uh, compared to COCs. Okay. See if we can go past. I'm sorry. Just a second. What are some counseling points and how can we facilitate uh, best use? We do want to talk about how to apply the patch, making sure that the skin is clean and dry. It must stick to the skin, all parts of it, all four corners. You can wear it again on the upper arm, torso, buttocks, and or, or lower uh, abdomen, but not on the breast. Uh, you do want to leave the patch off during that fourth week to allow for uh, the menstrual cycle. And use a backup method when patch is left on or off greater than uh, for, nine, to, for nine, nine days. Um, off for seven days if it's been detached for 24 hours. Oops, sorry. Any questions? I may have skipped the slide there. I apologize. Any questions? We have eight, about think... eight, eight minutes remaining. I'm going to go quickly through um, IUDs, intrauterine devices, and talk a little bit about the, the types of IUDs that are currently available. Uh, we have the um, copper T, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, which is made of polyethylene with barium sulfate. It is 36 millimeters in length and 32 millimeters in width. Then there's Mirena, the levonorgestrel uh, IUS, which releases levonorgestrel directly into the endometrial cavity at an initial rate of about 20 micrograms per day, which is what we also see in use with some CLCs. <clears throat> There's a, a picture of the copper tea as well as the morena. What's the mechanism of action for the copper? It causes an increase that the uh, presence of the copper uh, IUD causes an increase in the uterine and tubal fluids that contain copper ions, enzymes, prostaglandins, macrophages, and all of those impair sperm function and prevent fertilization of uh, the egg. Um, with the hormonal uh, morena, it thickens again the cervical mucus, suppresses endometrium, and it may suppress uh, ovulation even, so there's no penetrance to uh, the, uh, the endometrium tends to thin and it suppresses growth. Efficacy and duration. The copper may, is approved for use up to 10 years, and there's some data that indicates that it's effective up to 12 years, but uh, we generally want to have some discussions as we approach the 10 years around other options or, or changing the, um, the copper IUD out. The hormonal is approved for about half that time, five years, but it's thought to be uh, effective according to some data up to seven years. Uh, very, very effective. Um, the, both the copper and the hormonal, a cumulative 12 year fail, failure rate uh, in one study was shown that there was 0.7 to 2.2 pregnancies per 100 women. And a little bit uh, less with the hormonal um, uh, IUD. So very effective. Who criteria do not uh, show contraindications in IUDs during adolescence for uh, many years that age has, has been a factor in selecting 
uh, IUDs as an option, uh, but that the copper IUD can be indicated for those adolescents that are 16 years and up. Uh, those women who have not experienced pregnancies may have an increased risk of expulsion. So that's an increased risk of up to about 5% of losing the IUD over the course of the tenure of their IUD, whether 10 or 5 years. Who, is, who should not use IUDs? Any patient that has a current diagnosis of an STI or PID in the last three months, if there's any concern there could be an STI, if you're looking at cervicitis, any un, uh, abnormal uh, pat, uh, uterine um, anomalies, and then Wilson's disease, uh, which is a copper overload for those that may consider the copper IUD. We found that there have been some flaws in early research, and we talked about that around infection and some of the reasons that we can now expand who we use those in, and that the risk in some randomized controlled trials found that uh, infection in IUD use is actually pretty low. And the insertion process is, can be uh, uh, a potential transient risk for infection. Concerns with expulsion, we talked about very briefly, about 2 to 10 percent of IUD users, those who are nulliparous, would be uh, those that we would have most concern. And the risk for perforation is really low as well. Counseling um, issues or ways to facilitate counseling around uh, IUDs is to really address those myths and misconceptions that we spoke about. We want to reduce the risk of PID, so remove and replace the IUDs only when necessary. Um, I think that's one of the things to consider in our younger users uh, as to whether or not they clearly understand that IUD selection really kind of comes with a commitment for longer term use and counseling regarding symptoms of PID and expulsion so they clearly understand what they should do if they experience symptoms. They should identify symptoms. They should be able to articulate them throughout the visit. Each woman should be given an ID card with her IUD name and picture of the IUD as well as the insertion and recommended removal dates. And I do see some patients who five years later actually bring that card to visits. It's pretty impressive. Questions. We do have a couple of questions here. I see that uh, there's a question about can the patch be applied to the same site every month. Um, I've not seen anything that indicates that, they, that it cannot be applied to the same site. As I mentioned though, there may be an increased risk of hyperpigmentation or skin irritations, or so darker, uh, that skin may become darker where that patch site is. So for that reason, I would recommend, even if they choose the same site, if they try to, try to shift the proximity of where the previous patch uh, was, so if they go over a centimeter or, or down a centimeter, just to um, reduce the risk or the potential for uh, irritation. And what is the best way to switch between contraception methods is another question. In many cases, there does not need to be uh, a lag between switching uh, the contraceptive methods that we've mentioned here, as long as there has not been any gap in contraceptive use. So if the pill has, has not been missed for more than two days during that pill cycle, once they've completed that pill, they can, um, they, they can uh, for the next cycle, start the patch as long as there has not been any um, uh, disruption in, in the use of uh, the other methods. Um, IUDs are effective the same day. Um, so, you, I mean, there doesn't have to be uh, any concern with overlap. Uh, in those categories. We just wouldn't want to have multiple methods at the same time. Okay. And uh, I have
Okay. Um, again, we'd like to uh, thank you um, so much for your participation in the Primary Care for All dot org webinar series. Um, I want to definitely give special thanks to our presenter um, for a very lively and insightful and engaging presentation. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank our technical team, uh, which includes uh, Qualin and Qualin here and Jerry Robinson for their for their roles in making everything go smoothly. Um, and an, an evaluation for this webinar will pop up in another window if you're using Internet Explorer, and it will pop up in another tab if you are using Firefox. Uh, please join us next week for another intriguing and free CE presentation on caring for the migrant woman which will be Wednesday, July 6th at 8 p.m. And again, this series is made possible through a partnership between the National Center for Primary Care, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, the National Health Care for Homeless Council, and a Clinical Directors Network, and the Migrant Clinicians Network. This partnership allows the Primary Care for All.org to serve as a resource for the National Health Service Corps members and other clinicians working in underserved areas. Direct financial support for this webinar series is made possible through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Resources and Service Administration, the Bureau of Clinicians Recruitment and Services. And again, don't forget next week's presentation, Caring for Migrant Women. I definitely want to thank you so much, Dr. Moore Ruffin, for a very engaging and insightful presentation. And um, Again, it was a question about accessing this presentation, and it can be accessed at uh, www.primarycareforall.org. Um, this video and presentation will be accessible. Again, thank you all for your participation, and um, you have a wonderful evening.